working on and teaching actuarial science. I'm also a co-founder of uh, uh, Lead Finmax, which is an insure tech uh, uh, based in Tanzania, providing business consultation and the, uh, as well as the product design and the uh, etc. in insurance business. So uh, I welcome all of you and the, we have three people in our panelists today. If It will be good if I introduce them. I'll, I'll start with uh, Juan Boy, Duan Boy. Uh, Duan Boy is a director of the U.S. Department of Agriculture Risk Management Agents, uh, which is uh, saving uh, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. He has more than, I can say, more than 35 years of experience, particularly in agricultural insurance. So he's worth of uh, getting a lot of wisdom, particularly regarding to agricultural insurance uh, for the today's session. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Mr. Yusuf and Kate. Katerega, uh, he's an experienced economist by professional and also professional insurance. And he has been working for the as an economist as well as the insurance professional in the industry in Uganda for a long time before joining the uh, Makerere University Business School, where he is a lecturer of insurance. And he also worked for insurance training center in Uganda. And thirdly, we have Mr. Isa Kisongo in the panel. He's experienced the uh, insurance personnel as well as uh, has a good more than six years of experience in actuarial science. Uh, currently serving as deputy manager of risk management at Heritage Insurance Company Limited Tanzania. He has previously worked with the Tanzania Insurance Regulatory Authority. So we expect more regulatory issues uh, to share and to get a lot from him. Uh, so those are the panelists today. Welcome to the panel. So I, if we were maybe in a room, we could say let's clap for them. Uh, good. So probably it's nice to see you again, Isa, Kisongo, Juan, long time, more than a year now. We haven't seen uh, Yusuf also. Uh, the all participants, uh, I welcome you all. On the, uh, probably uh, we shall, our discussion will be for one hour and then after the first one hour, then I will allow the members who are not in the panel uh, to pose some questions, recommendation or anything which uh, they will find it uh, worth. It. And the, there is a chat room there for you can use it also for uh, chats. If you have questions, uh, uh, the panelists can respond also live uh, from the chat. So. The time might not be enough to answer all the questions, so we shall try our level best to use the chat, the chats. Also, just to tell you that the this uh, webinar is recorded, so after this one, I will ask the technical team for those who will be in need of it to share it with the uh, members so that you can have either as a for your library or wherever. So to start with. Uh, Maybe COVID-19 has been a pandemic and a global crisis that has already uh, having a devastating impact uh, in the world economy. And the, this impact has also been felt not only to uh, all parts of the economy, but also to the agriculture. And uh, it has even threatened the food security. And the, we as a agricultural uh, insurance professional, the stakeholders, uh, we have a role to play in the uh, agriculture to make sure that uh, this risk, uh, et cetera, how are they handled or how can uh, I mean, agricultural insurance play a role uh, in reducing the impacts or how can Africa uh, be a benefit from uh, agricultural insurance? And the, uh, uh, my first question maybe to the panelists, and, uh, according to the World Bank, the this pandemic uh, uh, could push around 100 million people into extreme poverty. And this can lead to uh, increase in unemployment rates, uh, income losses, and we have been seeing uh, the unemployment rate has been increasing. Also, uh, also uh, the rise in food costs in part, some parts of the world. And uh, as it is a well-known fact that the large population of Africa is employed in the agricultural sector. 
and the, since it is employed in the agricultural sector, it means it will be affected. So uh, what do you think, uh, like, uh, Duan, agricultural sector, how can the agricultural insurance or crop insurance, particularly where you are working, can intervene to reduce the impact of this COVID? Thank you. Can you hear me fine? Definitely. I am so glad to see you again, Laurent. It was so good to have you working in my office and uh, I hope to someday come visit you at your workplace as well. And I'm very glad and honored to be on this panel today. Welcome. Um, in, the, in the agriculture sector in the US, COVID has had uh, a, a great impact with the social distancing, but people still need to eat and we still need the food production. And, and in the US, um, our system of crop insurance um, primarily um, guarantees ag loans. I, I should also say that I am, a, I am a farmer. I own land in, in Iowa that I um, have farming. So I have that background as well. But the, the banks, um, because of COVID, they have some loans that are not as secure, but crop insurance does help secure farmer loans. We just had a major disaster event that went through the central part of Iowa, like a small hurricane, and people who were already stressed because of COVID, um, their spouses may have lost their jobs or may not be working. Um, people who were, because of trade issues, um, the prices have not been good for American farmers. And I've talked to several who, who were very um, discouraged, but the majority have crop insurance. We have adjusters out there. The banks are happier that the loans are going to be repaid. The farmers know that they can farm again next year and that um, they, they will be around to produce, but they, they have the security for this, this event. Um, it has changed the way that we have been interacting with the, uh, uh, like Zoom, and we we have been meeting with farmers and people this way and, and farm groups. So that's that's the situation here, unless you have additional questions. Anyone have a question about the crop insurance, I can't hear if you are speaking. Okay, so can you hear me? I said, uh, uh, yes. Uh, all right, uh, I'll turn back to you, Joan. I just ask uh, Yusuf what the situation in, uh, in Uganda, you have been having a lockdown there. What the situation of farmers there? Uh, Yusuf, you are muted. Thank you, uh, Roland. I think you can hear me so well. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Uh, the situation in Uganda is not uh, in any way different uh, from the situation all over the world. And to be specific in Africa, many farmers were affected by this specifically the last bit of it, you know, wouldn't say that COVID came in and killed crops. No, I want to share that in Uganda, for example, the weather has been fine this year and many farmers have been profiting. If you really see what has been happening, actually before COVID, they had a good season, despite some specific parts which were highly affected by locusts, but we've been having good rains. Generally, everything was normal, not until you know, the bubble did burst. And by March, as you know, there was a lockdown. The whole country went on to lockdown and when the lockdown was implemented, what happened was that very many farmers could not access markets, especially when it came to, many farmers would not access markets, especially when it came to accessing people who could buy their products. Uh, I have a specific fact, actually, uh, I could convert this in dollars um a trove of eggs these poultry eggs reached a point actually under normal circumstances it goes for three dollars each tray but this time you could get one at two dollars 
and people were just hawking eggs around and people were buying them at the least price you could imagine. So that was really a very bad impact. And when it came to issues related to people accessing their farmlands, for example, there was total lockdown and no one was allowed to move. The entire transport was affected and so on. So people could not access their farms. They had issues with labor moving from one place to another. Uh, load blocks were uh, all over everywhere. So it really affected the farmers and in any way that it affected their disposable income. And as I speak now, for Uganda's case, there has been some loosening, but the lockdown is still ongoing. So the situation has not really gotten better. But I can say that at least there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Government is trying to put some SOPs and people are really coming back to work. But for the farmers, mainly it affected them when it came to accessing markets. Thank you. All right. All right. Having said that, uh, probably I can ask you, Issa, uh, uh, is the situation in Tanzania where you have, Tanzania has not experienced uh, something like lockdown, etc. Uh, in one minute, what's the situation of uh, farmers? When I speak of farmers, I mean totally to in agriculture, farmers, livestock, etc. Just in one minute, Issa, before we move on to the next one. It's, uh, I can't get you. I can't hear you, Isa. Right. Anyway, uh, uh, I say, my will go I want to the thing. Okay, so probably we can move on. Is are you back? Probably, I can't hear you. Uh, maybe you have technical issues with your mic. Uh, I can't. I, I can't get you. Maybe can you try to recheck and then uh, your connection, please, particularly your mic. Uh, so uh, maybe I can pose a, another question, uh, like uh, uh, Yosef, you have said like uh, farmers, the, there was no a serious problem before for, during COVID time, and the, but there is a serious concern that uh, farmers might not be able to probably plant this year because most of the season, particularly in African countries, start at the end of the year, December, November, October, uh, or probably the next year, early next year because of the COVID situation and the lockdown. And the, uh, this might translate into lack of food, probably or reduce the uh, food security this year, at the end of this year, 2021. Uh, how are farmers? Uh, 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 how are farmers uh, protected or reduced in this risk? Yeah, and the, is there anything to do with the crop insurance in Uganda, and the, how is it helping? Uh, you are muted, Yusuf. Yeah, I'm back. Thank you uh, for that question. And I think now this is where the po this is the point where crop insurance has to come in. When you really look at the nature of crop insurance, it's more of a parametric insurance indexed to incorporating weather, things like that. But now here comes COVID. It was unthought of and it's a natural disaster to get it. And you realize that one of the reasons why farmers may not be in position to plant again is because they don't have enough disposable income, given the fact that if they managed to sell their products, they sold at almost zero prices. And other farmers reported, actually there is a, a picture I saw of the lady in Western Uganda who had almost all his bananas ripen in the garden because there were load blocks everywhere, he could not access the markets. So you don't expect such a farmer to be in position to have enough income to buy inputs for the next season. So that's why they say that it will be hard for them and probably we have hunger room in, in the corner. But now the issue is, if you critically look at uh, insurers, the question is, isn't it the time to be in position to come in and help these farmers? Or if um, this couldn't go to the insurers per se, this is now the work of government because government has come in in several dimensions to try and see that they address the COVID pandemic. Though they are doing it from the health perspective, now is the time to come in and see how do they help these farmers and be in position to at least avail them with the required resources 
to be in position to at least get some inputs and be able to play the next season. Also, the other one, like for Uganda's case, could go to trying to loosen the, 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 the lockdown uh, principles or procedures which were earlier set up. Let's farmers be in position to access markets and also be in position to access uh, their farms. And labor should be in position to move somewhere and somehow such that the things would slowly but surely go back to normal. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Hello? I uh, can't hear you. Maybe, are you hearing him? Joan, can you hear you, sir? No, I cannot hear you, sir. Uh, right, I think uh, there is a technical issue with this. Uh, so while we are waiting, uh, to resolve the issue, maybe I can pose a question to Joan. Uh, like, uh, what Africa has to learn from you, as particularly you have said uh, your farmers probably are happy and they, uh, since uh, they have proper insurance system. So given the nature of African farmers is different from the US, we have small scale farmers, which I'm sure you are familiar with. And the, uh, given your experience to help other countries uh, to adopt the crop insurance system, etc. So what can you recommend particularly on helping these farmers uh, on this uh, during this COVID? So I don't, I don't know if what I have to offer will, will apply directly to, um, to, to Africa. I have worked um, with Azerbaijan and they did implement a crop insurance program. I've worked with Canada who also has a crop insurance program. The biggest issue uh, for farmers, I think worldwide is access to credit um, because farming can be expensive. The equipment, the seed to buy, or the, the labor and and to put in that crop, you you spend a lot of money, and then how do you, if you lose that crop, how do you have enough money to put the inputs in next year? And in most of the countries I've talked to, even in the U.S., banks don't want to loan if there is not some sort of security for that crop. And and in COVID. Uh, there are other risks going on um, with people not working and 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 we have some children who who are not in school and and so there is a, a reluctance to provide that credit unless there is some security and knowledge that they um, if the crop fails that the bank can be paid back so I think that's how how crop insurance uh, provides some of that security um, we do have some very small farms as well, um, usually very specialty crops, food crops, uh, small greenhouses, and places that provide uh, food directly to restaurants and things. And, and they have the same kinds of issues of, uh, of the health, you know, with COVID, people want to know was my food, if I'm buying local food, is it say, handled properly? So, so we've had to work through some of those issues. Oh, right. Uh, thank you. Yes, are you back? Kesongo, can you hear me? You are muted. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Still, we have problem with the, your system. Uh, while we are waiting for Issa, maybe I can pose another question, maybe to uh, Issa. Uh, right. Uh, okay. So, uh, Lauren, can I add something really quick? Uh, okay, I will. Okay, just one minute while we are waiting. Is uh, yeah. just uh, um, I was just going to add really quickly. Uh, my name is Lindsay Mortegi. I'm with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's Farm Service Agency. And to address your question of what are maybe some things that could be implemented um, there or thought about that are happening in the United States, one of the things that we do as an agency is. We've got some programs where um, there is disaster assistance available for you that basically acts like insurance. So whether you are an insurance 
company or uh, a government agency that maybe has programs to support farmers. Um, what we do is we have different levels of coverage and like a basic 50% insurance coverage level is free for certain producers. So that it's more accessible to new and beginning farmers, um, farmers that um, are minority producers and have more difficulty obtaining loans and things like that. So um, just some things to consider there. So, right. healing, healing, can you hear me? Yes, yes, and now I can get you. So, you. yeah, definitely very well. Thank you for working on it. And uh, probably I can pose a little question. You have been uh, working with the Insurance Regulatory Authority previously and the uh, good experience. And uh, I wonder in Tanzania, we have, uh, particularly in Tanzania, and this is a problem in most of our African countries. Uh, uh, we don't have like uh, insurance coverage has been a problem. What do you think uh, is the main challenge to have insurance covers for most of African farmers? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you. For, uh, thank you so much for having uh, a little faith in me while solving this uh, trouble. And uh, I'm really happy to be uh, among the panelists uh, to uh, lead this uh, webinar on very interesting topic. So like uh, a little overview on uh, why are we, or the current position of the crop insurance uh, in uh, Tanzania economy is, you know, uh, agricultural sector in Tanzania contribute um, a quite uh, significant percentage in the, in the economy. So uh, apart from COVID-19, even uh, other, uh, any other crisis, the sector has to be protected. So uh, as one of the intervention, insurance uh, uh, has been uh, somehow helpful in terms of uh, providing cover to some farmers uh, in rural area, though it's only a few insurance companies right now that are currently offering the uh, the, the crop insurance coverage. And this is most because of the uh, pay, payment ability uh, from the rural people who are mostly farmers. Uh, they cannot afford uh, the price of the uh, crop insurance, but also uh, right now the laws require that uh, the full premium should be paid uh, for a cover to be affected. So you might find if uh, an insurance company has partnered with uh, uh, development partners and try to be able to assist uh, some of the co farmers cooperatives union, sometimes uh, the cover got canceled because it's a huge premium. And these farmers only depend on the, uh, on the agriculture for their livelihood and a little surplus, which uh, is for commercial purposes. So, at times, uh, for underwriting purposes, these insurance companies now fail to, uh, to be able to provide those cover to, to these poor farmers. So I think uh, uh, the main challenge is the funding. Uh, this is not a, a sector that should be uh, protected only by the government side or by the private side. It should be a, a combination of two, like the, the private public partnerships because it involves fundings, it involves subsidies and, and so many others. So currently, I would say that are the, are the main, main, main challenges. Uh, so that's the main challenge. What the role, maybe this, this question to you again, uh, what the role of microinsurance uh, in that case? Okay, uh, again, uh, as I said earlier, it's almost uh, uh, approximately to 31% uh, of our economy is driven by agriculture. And uh, I mean, the, the revenue from the export is 24.1% from the agricultural sectors. So uh, how, how can we say uh, microinsurance play a, a greater role in, uh, in providing the, the, the crop insurance uh, uh, mechanism to this farmer is of all the 31% uh, 
uh, output from our GDP came from the agriculture and 83% of farmers are sitting in rural areas. And that means these guys are poor farmers who uh, are doing farming just to survive and have a little surplus for, for, their, uh, for meeting other needs. So talking about microinsurance, is straight away capture these farmers. These farmers who are contributing uh, quite a significant percentage in our economy. So designing a microinsurance, which is uh, like an insurance which is designed for poor people. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, it's a proportional or direct proportional that microinsurance uh, framework uh, likely 100% impact the the lives of farmers and right now it's only few insurance companies that are currently offering the the micro insurance you know farmers do do really need uh, the protection mechanism from insurance but i think they need more than that there are other uh, non-government organizations such as one acre fund vision fund they do provide uh, some insurance mechanism, but over and above that, they do provide training for farmers, visiting the, the farmer to see how they are conducting their cultivation activities. Because once again, uh, the literacy level for these people is quite, uh, is quite uh, lower compared to the urban uh, population. So uh, if insurance companies such as uh, we have currently 26 general insurance companies and five insurance companies coming together, together with the development partners and the government initiatives, provide subsidy, provide funding for microinsurance to take over, will definitely assist this farmer to have uh, their crop be protected from adverse uh, weather experience. But not only that, because they do not hire laborers, they are the ones who are going to farms. They are the one who are leading their farm. So what if they get sick? What if uh, somebody's children is in the hospital? That means that the main economic activities that they depend on will stop because uh, the father, the mother is at the hospital. So uh, it goes over and above the agricultural insurance. It goes to cover those other peril that farmers are, are sick, uh, I mean, are suffering uh, from their daily life. So microinsurance, it, it is some uh, initiative, I understand TIRA, uh, together with other development partners, including FSDTs, are working uh, uh, tirelessly to make sure that this is happening. But once again, uh, the insurance company has to be innovative and be ready to, to bear some kind of losses, because this is a loss somehow, uh, it has to be funded. So it somehow provide a, a not a quite a, a positive underwriting experience. But at the end of the time, we need, at the end of the day, we need to protect our, our economy. So public partnership uh, is quite vital. And again, microinsurance success, it means uh, these poor farmers uh, are again uh, be protected, not only on the crop insurance, but other perils such as health and life and, and funeral. That is what I can say for now. All right. Thank you, Issa. Uh, before I turn to Juan, let's go to Yusuf. Uh, uh, Issa has stressed this, like uh, the coverage of the insurance, particularly like covering one risk might be expensive to African farmers. What do you think about the role of uh, multiple insurance coverage, particularly? What can we speak about that? Yusuf. You are muted. Oh, I'm back. Okay. Yeah, I accept that, you know, when it comes to insurance, one leads to the other. So you may think like he said that, you know, you are covering the crops and you forget that as you are covering the crops, we are doing individual farming. It's the farmers who go to the garden. So what if the farmer gets sick? But again, he has no money to take himself to the hospital. So we should think along those lines, but to be specific when it comes to agriculture insurance, this thing is just beyond what we think it is. It should be a combination of quite a number of things going just 
you know, let's look at it from the perspective of, uh, you know, disaster risk financing. There has to come up issues like regional risk pools. I've uh, seen what uh, African risk capacity has done. Uh, we should do, think of issues like uh, deploying targeted premium support uh, to the farmers and to individuals where possible. And there should be things related to long-term prudence when it comes to, uh, you know, propelling like these microfinance institutions to be in a position at least to support premium loans for these farmers. You get it. So when it comes to agriculture insurance specifically and the farmers themselves, it's an issue of lifting them away from, you know, poverty and, you know, they reach a, a point of self-sustaining. So the question comes back is that can insurance do it? If insurance can do it, then that's well and good. But if insurance can't do it outright as insurance, then we really have to call in the government and the role of the government in this case, and then the role of other uh, stakeholders, specifically regional pools, and ensuring that at least they can provide, I mean, protect the farmers and the crops themselves, all other things related to agriculture insurance. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we should call for other stakeholders. Uh, now, this gives me the chance to turn to Joanne. Uh, you, from your recent experience, particularly, I think it was last year, you have been consulting with the Azerbaijan government, and uh, you advise on how the public-private partnership can help, uh, particularly in implementation of uh, maybe crop insurance system. So what Africa can learn from that and the, uh, how can it go, particularly like uh, during this COVID-19, how could that help probably if uh, we shall have maybe another pandemic, we, although we don't pray for that, but it might happen since it's a race. Right. So what Africa pr probably can learn through that experience. I, I really appreciated what, what Isa had to say about the public-private, uh, because that, that has been the American experience. Uh, we've had several insurance companies go bankrupt in the past without some form of government uh, subsidy or or re the government as the reinsurer to the private sector, um, and so we I, I appreciate what he's saying because that that has played out. That was also important in Azerbaijan, um, where they have some very well developed agriculture, but some very undeveloped agriculture and small farms. Uh, one hectare, two hectare farms. Um, one of the concerns in Azerbaijan, as well as in America, is is corruption, and and that is you know where one one group is taking advantage of another. It could be banks uh, taking advantage of farmers, could be farmers taking advantage of insurance company, insurance company taking advantage of the government, and one of the the reasons this public private system works is because if everybody has a little bit of money in the game and ha and make some profit, um, the government's watching, the insurance companies watching, the farmers watching, the banks watch, everybody's watching each other and it kind of limits who, who who can take advantage in the system. And so I think, I think Issa's point is very, very important. And the, the, Crop insurance in, in Azerbaijan, as well as in America, people tend to stay where they are in farming if they want to grow bigger and produce more than just to feed their family or just more than, than, than they use locally. They need to usually make some investments and that might be an irrigation system, which they can't afford. It might be some greenhouses. It might be some other protection or better seed or some research and to do that, crop insurance can help. And then I think it was Yusuf that made, made the point that I think is very important is looking at history and, the, and having that data to look back at what were the causes of loss? What were the, the disasters? What, what are we insuring against? And what has been the history? And um, I know we collect a lot of data uh, so that we can have an actuarially sound program as much as possible but that requires a lot of data collection. So I will stop there. The issue of data, that give me another 
uh, this is uh, give me the chance to turn to Issa. Uh, one of the issues which uh, I think they have hindered the penetration of uh, crop insurance or agricultural insurance in African countries is uh, insufficient, I can say, unreliable and a lack of credible data. So how is this a big challenge to development or design of insurance products in connection also with the distribution channels? Okay, thank you, Shilling. I don't know if you can hear me. Definitely. Okay. Very well. Yeah, so I think when we, we talk about data, uh, that is a, it's an African challenge. So, uh, and in probably uh, in other parts of the world. So data has been uh, quite a challenge, which denies uh, some researchers efforts in coming up with a, a socioeconomic uh, solution uh, of which uh, agriculture or crop insurance might be uh, one of them. So uh, good enough, uh, right now uh, we have a number of tools. We have uh, systems and actually uh, there is a technological advancement in terms of uh, collecting data. So uh, as I did speak, uh, Tanzania, we are currently implementing uh, the national uh, financial inclusion framework of, which is the second phase. And this uh, NIDA or National Identifications Authority is one of the stakeholders, which uh, actually will provide a, a centralized database of every person's uh, and these farmers of which are also having this national ID will be a part and parcel of the uh, uh, parameters. So uh, with the implementation of na the national financial inclusion framework, a lot of information will be collected uh, from various stakeholders, including banks, including the insurance companies. So right now what is happening is, let's say in the financial sectors, the regulators are uh, trying to improve uh, their reporting structures to at least include more comprehensive parameters, include the locations of the, I, I'll speak up more about insurance. So previously we didn't collect data on the regional wise, but right now we're having data on regional wise. So assume if you have a crop insurance and you're collecting such kind of information, definitely you will understand uh, where uh, crop insurance is much needed and where is low, where you can put such kind of initiatives. So we had a lot of challenge in terms of collecting data, but right now what we should be focusing on is how can we use the available information to come up with the initiatives or solutions which will assist uh, agricultural stakeholders in terms of developing products, in terms of uh, uh, making case to development partners uh, and so on. So uh, generally I would say uh, data has been a challenge, but that shouldn't be our focus. Our focus is, okay, we have these data, let us, this, let us use this data and came up with a socioeconomic solution to solve the need of the, uh, the farmers, particularly coming up with the products, microinsurance products, which will cover the, the various periods which we have, already, we have already discussed. And again, uh, after implementation of the National Financial Inclusion Framework, our anticipation is to measure whether, how many people are financially included. So actually this will include uh, information. This will include data to justify uh, we have been uh, successful in terms of making uh, farmer access credit, farmer accessing financing uh, uh, from the banks and stuff. And speaking about that, uh, we have the bank, bank assurance regulations. You know, compared to, to most of the uh, insurance agents, insurance brokers, they are not widespread in the, in, the, in, the, in the country. But having the bank coming into play in insurance sectors, banks are somehow uh, more comprehensive, more credible, and actually they have those kind of uh, uh, data framework that will be able to complement to the insurance sectors to come up with a, a customized insurance product for, for the farmers. So, 
if the farmer uh, will have an access to crop insurance from an insurance company, will again have the funding from the bank. If he's not able to pay the premium, will have the insurance premium financing, again from the bank with an extra fee. So I would say, uh, let us agree data is a challenge, but uh, we have to solve this. And what we can use is what we have right now and build the better future by, uh, of course, uh, investing in big data and in data infrastructure that will uh, assist the future generation. Uh, thank you, Issa. Uh, you have talked about bank assurance, but uh, the way I know a uh, large per percent, big percent of our African population, particularly these farmers who are smallholders, are uh, in rural areas. And uh, uh, in case of uh, insurance products, I think the good product should be affordable, not only affordable and customized, but also should be accessible. Uh, we know that uh, the large percent of these people are not bankable like uh, they have no they don't have access to banks so what do you think will be the good design uh, of these products to make sure that uh, it's taken into consideration and we tap the data uh, to this yeah. population which uh, probably they might not be able to access banks Thank you so much, Shilingi. You know, uh, looking into that, uh, you see, uh, among the East African country, uh, Tanzania is one among the country who, uh, which has succeeded in terms of uh, mobile network operators. The use of Tigo Pesa, Airtel Money, and, uh, and so uh, on, like the wallet mobile money. So apart, the farmer might not have uh, an access to a bank account, uh, like going physically to the branch which is located in that district, but can access that uh, banking branch through his phone, can access that the bank through using the USSD. And most of the, I've been to Tira and we had this uh, uh, proposal from one of the insurance company, which has partnered with the uh, development partner. And they developed that and linked it to the bank, but not uh, a bank account. They use the USSD code. So a farmer is not required even to have a smartphone. It's simply a normal phone, which can also uh, be used to register a simple bank account uh, where the farmer can access the funding. And again, if there is any products can also be accessed using the USSD code. So the, the issue of technology there and uh, looking into uh, Tanzanian perspectives, I understand almost 90% of, uh, of our population are having phone, regardless whether it's a smartphone or a normal phone. So it's a, it's a issue of hacking the system. Okay, we want you to go to the bank, but not going straightly to the, to the branch. You want you to access the bank using the USSC code, we want you to access your funding while you are on bed, sleeping, while you are farming in your village. So okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I hope that hacking the system is ethical hacking. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> Juan. <laughs> so, Juan. Uh, Juan. Uh, probably Isa has talked about uh, this. Uh, farmers accessing funds. Uh, can you probably tell us how probably insurance company? We are speaking about. Uh, helping the farmers, uh, particularly in pandemic, like uh, the COVID. Uh, now, how can insurance company uh, act as a collateral to act uh, like a micro, to, to help these uh, smallholders farmers to, uh, to acquire like micro yeah. loans from the banks or other financial institutions? Right. Um, so if a farmer in the US or, or in anywhere in the world really, wants to, for example, improve their, their farm by adding some irrigation, but they need to buy some equipment. And they go to a bank and say, I would like to buy this irrigation equipment. And the bank says, no, your credit's not good enough. We don't, we don't think you'll be able to pay back this loan. If you can go and get a uh, a, a micro crop insurance policy or, or crop insurance policy. And for that premium or however it's paid, you obtain that and you get a certain level of coverage at a certain dollar amount and you 
take that to the bank and say, look, I have this coverage. And the, what happens is then the bank will loan the money up to that policy um, coverage amount. And in the United States, what happens is you sign um, that if you can't pay it back, then the bank gets the farmer can then go buy that insurance or that irrigation equipment with the loan he got with his insurance policy <laughs> and, and put that in there and irrigate, hopefully doesn't have a loss, has a better crop, pays back his loan and can farm next year and maybe take out a loan with a different crop insurance, a new crop insurance policy, and maybe next year invest in some fertilizer or some additional inputs to improve the crops. And, and over time, usually over a long period of time, the producer starts gaining new inputs, technology, and is able to produce more, having more to sell and make a profit. The bank profits, the insurance company profits, and they, there is security, financial security within the system. Okay, thank you, Joan. Uh, having said that, uh, probably uh, Yusuf has the experience of the East African market. Uh, how is this applicable in East Africa and market? Yusuf? You are muted. All right, okay. I'm back. Thanks, uh, Roland. Now what is happening here is quite simple. Uh, from all our discussion, you can see that there are linkages in this case. Uh, take for example, if a farmer is in position to have a micro insurance policy for his crops or his animals, whatever he has, that one can serve as a basis for him to access credit from a <coughs> institution. And in this case, he can take up his crops as collateral to get it. But once they, you know, they are insured, they can act as collateral, he can take them. And then, you know, with the policy, they should be positioned to give him a line of credit, which can help him to be in position to buy fertilizers, to buy machines, and so on and so forth. But still, the challenge we face in East Africa, to be specific, you know, there is this crop insurance, which is totally parametric based. And now we have COVID in place. And so my thinking in this case would be, why don't we think beyond, there are two dimensions in this case. Why don't we think beyond index insurance, for example, and we design products that are specific to specific farmers or specific crops, but not necessarily index-based. Because when you look at the nature of parametric insurance, it will tell you that compensation will come in provided, you know, predetermined, it actually it's even a predetermined model. This happened, this happened, and this happened. So when we compute and this has happened, then we should be in position to pay you. And you have countries like Uganda, where index insurance, in most cases, claims can be too full of because we, we don't have a lot of droughts and so on and so on. So our weather is a bit predictable. So why don't we come in with these specific insurance products which are designed for specific micro farmers and they're in position to address the farmers, putting into consideration the linkages I've been positioned to tell you that when I have a particular insurance cover, I've been positioned to put my crops as, you know, I'll be in position to access this and certainly at the end of the day, I'll be in position to improve my well-being. And also, back to that, I'll also think about a scenario where we incorporate disasters like COVID into what constitutes the basket within that index. You know, it's weather, you know, and things. So what about we think about these natural disasters like COVID and you're like, okay, what if it comes part of what is contained in the basket of index? I think we should start thinking along those lines in one way or another, it should be in position to help farmers gain access to this insurance. So thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, probably. Uh, Can I ask uh, a question? Also... Yes, Joanne. To, to Yusuf, what, uh, do you have currently index insurance and, and what kind of index insurance? All right. Uh, uh, we we have index insurance. We have index insurance for drought, but uh, what kinds? I'm just curious. Okay, if uh, okay. You, okay, Yusuf, and then I'll ask also Isa. Okay, Yusuf. It's purely weather based, like you said the other side. It's a 
like one clause fits all though with some little dimensions, but it's still weather based in essentials. All right, it's uh, probably from your experience. What kind of uh, indexes are uh, index insurance are they existing probably in African market, but like the case of Tanzania? You are muted, Isa. Okay, I think you can hear me right now. Yeah, so uh, as, I, as I said earlier, uh, agricultural insurance uh, in a Tanzania insurance market, it's quite not more uh, matured compared to most of the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, East African country or African country. And currently we have only, uh, I think, three insurance company uh, which are offering the uh, crop insurance. And as similar to Uganda or what as Yusuf has said, it's a typical uh, weather index uh, insurance. And uh, mostly the parameter used are the rainfall. So they use uh, the, the satellites, whether the trend of rainfall goes down and then there is a pre-agreed pre value on how the, the farmer will be compensated, whether uh, the, the actual experience differ from what was anticipated during the inception of the policy. But I do agree with uh, Yusuf. We, we need to think more of, of other perils that uh, might be uh, an, uh, like uh, a problem to these farmers over and above the tying the insurance to only uh, weather index issues. So there are more other risks that are not weather related, which again should be covered. And we're expert in the insurance and we need to, to do uh, like uh, some kind of research or coming up with the products uh, which covers more than just uh, uh, the, weather, the weather parameter. All right, Isa, uh, because of time, I need uh, to pose the last question to the panelists before I welcome uh, other participants uh, to give their recommendation. I think we have uh, some questions also on the chats, so the panelists you should also be visiting if you have access to uh, see if you can answer directly because you might not have the time to answer all the questions. Uh, uh, the last question to the panelists. So we have seen this. Uh, what public policies and regulation reforms are needed in Africa, probably, uh, African countries, in order to create an enabling environment to mobilize the uh, penetration of agricultural insurance? Maybe I'll start with uh, Isa, then Yusuf, and the, finally, uh, the same question will go to Joanne, probably uh, what you can we really learn from the developed countries like the US? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raul. And as we all understand that uh, uh, the backbone of the African economy is agriculture. So uh, in the crop insurance or insurance interventions, as per the many research which have been done, as one has already mentioned the experience from the US and Azerbaijan, the private partnership uh, initiatives i think for myself for my view is a way to go this is not like we are trying to so to, to to assist just farmers but it is an economic crisis which we all should participate so if the the agricultural sector is at stake it's not the issue of the government it's not the issue of the uh, the private sectors it's for all stakeholders so, I mean, the, the policies and the, which will at least stimulate or enabling environment to enhance uh, the operation of the agriculture in terms of uh, provision necessary interventions such as insurance and funding and so on will require both private sectors and the government to jointly uh, come up with the strategies and initiatives because once again, it involves uh, every uh, contribution from every part. So such as an insurance, there is a funding. And then when it comes to affordability of the, the farmer, then there has to be subsidies from the, from the government and so okay. on and so on, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Isa. Yusuf? <clears throat> you are muted, Yusuf. I'm back. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we've had this discussion and if you critically look, we've been on the side of farmers, but uh, someone texted me and told me, hey, even we insurers were affected by COVID. Why are you discussing only the farmer's side? <laughs> so okay. uh, my conclusion in this case is going to go to the insurance companies too. You get it. You know, it hit everyone. As farmers were affected, even insurers were what? Were affected. But what do we learn from this? On top of calling in government to continue subsidizing for the farmers and ensuring that they pay their premiums and so on and so forth, uh, even on the insurer's side, this was a test for them, for their operational viability. You get it. So as insurers, they should be in position to wither whatever comes their way. If you really launched a product, uh, probably to farmers that never survived COVID, you should go back to the drawing board and you should be in position to think and like, okay, uh, what if I modeled and I included, uh, you know, I, uh, I incorporated in the issue of COVID into my product and being in position to survive despite the uh, uh, customers or what I could call the insured is not being in position to pay premiums for a period of six months. Can the product still survive? And then also what I could probably say to the insurers is let them adopt technology. You get it. This has been a test of us. You see we on Zoom right now. You get it. This wasn't unseen of by them. So they should be in position to adopt technologies and then involve their farmers into technology to be in position to continue despite existing this, you know, these existing conditions. And probably last on that is insurers should be in position to build what we call operational resiliences of their farms amidst such uh, crises right together. And to the farmers, it's government. You know, we always run back to government. Government should be in position to support the farmers, to support the institutions, to support the different school stakeholders, consortiums, and so on, to be in position to help farmers become afloat from this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Joanne, uh, what do you think uh, should be the pol public policies or regulations that need to be reformed in African countries? Yeah. Well, I, I don't yes, know that don't. I'm in a position I don't know that I'm in a position to give you advice, but um, right. I can tell you a few things. One of the things that comes up in America all the time is um, we always have a certain percentage of farmers that go bankrupt. And so insurance is not meant to preserve every single farm to make a profit. Um, it, what it does is it allows farmers to invest and be competitive and to make a profit. And those who, you know, if you if you think of a normal bell curve, there's going to be some, some very people out in front innovating. There's gonna be the majority producing food, but then there's going to be some inefficient ones. And as markets develop and as, you know, exports and markets, some people who do not um, embrace change and innovation may not be able to keep farming. And those who are more, uh, adaptive to change and to new techniques and to better production methods who are able to produce more, they survive, make a profit and thrive. And so one of the challenges we've always had is, um, the, you know, you let, you let some farmers go bankrupt. Well, the market does. Our job isn't to keep them in business. Our job is to make sure that the ag economy the ag sector is thriving, growing, and producing what we need. It's part of a um, food security for the nation. Everybody likes to eat, and so it's, society has a vested interest in having a thriving farm economy where uh, they produce excess food, hopefully so that some can be exported. But it is not meant to keep every farmer in business, and that's just kind of a hard truth. All uh, right, everybody likes to eat. I think I like more than anybody here. Uh, so, <laughs> so the last one, because we are almost one hour to, we should allow some questions. Uh, what, is there any room for uh, partnership? We have seen like we have Wagoa, et cetera, bet between partnership between the US and the uh, African countries. Uh, what are the rooms for uh, collaboration, particularly in terms of agricultural insurance you can see, Duan? 
So, you know that many of the crop insurance companies are global. So there are some U.S. companies who are owned by insurance companies in Australia, in Switzerland, in Germany, um, and they spread the risk worldwide. So crop insurance in the U.S. is not is not a U.S. business, but a global business, and many of those companies are willing to invest in other countries um, and partner with them as a reinsurer or to be part of that and maybe share some of their experience and technology. Um, I know some British companies are working with India crop insurance. I know some American companies um, work with all over the world, but um, I think there will be opportunities. Thank you very much. Now, uh, this marks uh, the end of the panel discussion. And now uh, I welcome the questions from the members. And we have some two questions uh, on the chat box here. And uh, probably I can pose to the panelists, whoever think he can answer, he can answer them. We shall use five minutes and then I will welcome other members who are in this discussion or in this webinar here to either contribute. Is, uh, ask question or give a recommendation. So I'll start to, with the question from Agnella. Uh, I think Yusuf, you, uh, you talked about uh, the issue of uh, transportation and chain value. So Agnella is asking what are the major effect of uh, pandemic has no, been no, devastation. Only a very... oh, sorry. Okay, uh, the major effect of this uh, pandemic has been devastation of transportation and we have seen the effects this has had on uh, supply mm -hmm. chains of agricultural products across uh, borders. Now, mm -hmm. how can agricultural insurance play? Can you, other members, please mute while, uh, so that we can hear each other. So how can agricultural insurance play a part in strengthening uh, supply chains for the benefits of both producers and the consumers? Anyone who? Yes, uh, Yusuf, I think you spoke about that before. Yes, I, I, I did speak about that now. The issue is, we really need to ask these questions. Where does agricultural insurance start and where does it stop? You realize that it starts from when the crop is put or when the animal is whatever, the delivery process until when harvesting has been done. Then who caters for the post-harvest losses? get it crop insurance does not cater for post harvest losses so can we design a way of extending beyond that that it reaches the market in case you are not and you realize it's a bit hard to come up with such kind of cover which and you categorize it under agriculture that when there are post harvest losses you know we can come in to cover you but if we think beyond can we design a particular product that goes beyond post harvest until the farmer is in position to access his markets that is a point to ponder upon and see what can be done. But again, from my perspective, we suffered in Uganda because the borders were closed, but uh, internally they were, um, there was an allowance of movement of goods, though the market wasn't sufficient for all the farmers. But that can't rule out the fact that many farmers were affected because they could not take their market, I mean, their products to the market specifically. You know, that all right. Done and the rest. Thank you. you uh, Kisongo, the same issue, the movement, uh, the supply chain, we have seen the issue between uh, the Kenya and Tanzania, particularly uh, after the closure of border because of COVID-19 and the many farmers particularly were affected their products. So what can you recommend in relation to this question? You are muted, Isa. Okay, you can hear me right now. Eh? Definitely. So uh, if you may recall, uh, when we started this, uh, I mean, this webinar, I said 24.1% of our export revenue, I'm talking about Tanzania, are coming from uh, agricultural sectors, which means uh, the closure of the, board, the, the borders and territory uh, between our country and other country will definitely have an impact on there. Uh, export revenue that we might anticipate to get from the agriculture sector. But again, uh, th this is a, a crop insurance and the issue that we are discussing, the impact that we are discussing are post 
the agricultural uh, activities. So uh, I have come across to see some of the insurance policies, uh, it's, which is somehow uh, agriculture, but it is uh, tied with the price. So you mentioned, say, you have maize and uh, you are going to sell a maize in January next year with a pre-agreed price. So it depends whether the market price during that time goes down or goes up, and then someone will be covered on the difference. So such kind of an insurance might be uh, complemented to the, uh, to the crop uh, insurance, which is uh, like the traditional uh, crop insurance that we are having. But uh, for as far as uh, the supply chain and the uh, borders issue, I think that's uh, quite a wide issue, more than just an, uh, a crop insurance. It's a joint uh, uh, related to other uh, sectors such as tourism, transportation, and so on. It cannot okay. be dealt uh, solely by its own. Thank, thank, thank you, Isa. Uh, do we have anything to learn from you as pertaining this, Juan? I, I don't know what I can offer on, on, on this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question from Satish Ehobo is from India. Uh, specific insurance, uh, specific insurance for crop might increase expense ratio drastically and might turn in turn increase the premium for customers, which could be a problem for developing country. I think it was kind of a, a recommendation. So I welcome other members. Uh, before I welcome the last question from the chat was uh, from also Satish. Uh, who was speaking about uh, the best way to for insurance is to have uh, in the, uh, crop insurance is uh, probably to have index based insurance and the, he wanted to ask if it is better to diversify the risk for many countries government to form some sort of pool which is governed by <clears throat> different stakeholders could the diversifying risk like this reduce the cost of insurance Probably I can respond to that, uh, Mr. Shilingi. Yes. Uh, speaking about uh, Tanzanian experience and the overall uh, exposure of risk that uh, farmers are having and looking into the capacity of the most of the insurance company vis-a-vis -vis the uh, anticipated loss ratio, which uh, are likely to happen from the crop insurance. Few insurance are able to, to keep that risk on their net which means there is a room for insurance company, there is a room for co-insurance, there is a room for creating a pool, whether uh, located uh, uh, in our own jurisdiction or located in UK or US and so on. So diversifying, or in other words, uh, having a comprehensive reinsurance program will again uh, assist these local insurance company to be able to accept those risks because at the end of the day they know the loss are coming but we are going to diversify it by sharing with that with other other partners so i totally agree with the teach that uh, diversifying the risk in terms of having the pools and comprehensive or uh, well spread reinsurance structures and this might be uh, as a result of whether market practitioners uh, which means insurance company, or we can also uh, be able to uh, have this kind of initiative uh, established by by the uh, the government. Uh, all right, uh, Yusuf, do you have anything to add on? I was just asking that is that a point where we are, you know when we are looking at one of what covered our theme, we talked about basis risk. And the, you know, by definition, basis risk talks about uh, insurers looking for complement by hedging way beyond reinsurance, uh, such that in case they expected and they actually do not carry, you know, it's too much mathematics where they go into securitization and so on and so forth. Is it a point where we can, can we reach that point anyway? Uh, and we securitize and we come up with products such that in case they expected it, cover is less than, I mean, is way beyond the actual, you know, there's something to cater for that, but, you know, it might not be a discussion for this forum, but I, I saw it somewhere and I wanted to pick on it, basis risk and the rest. Sure, sure. Another question from Albert Mbonea Rapson. Uh, whether indexing insurance will be idle work for micro 
products mainly because it is more cost effective as opposed to MVCI whereby a farmer has mm -hmm. extra cost such as risk survey, agronomist, etc. It is however highly dependent on weather data, which is yep. a key problem I can say in African countries. Uh, are there any LEDC that has successfully implemented weather index insurance and how can we improve in this? And a suggestion. This is Dwayne. And after I answer this, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave. Sure. But the United States, we have index programs and there's, there's good and bad with it. We have, um, it's cheaper. You don't need to have loss adjusters. You can use the satellite okay. and data, but it, it is possible in a grid to lose your crop when the, when the weather station in the grid or the satellite says that your grid was okay, but you personally were on the edge and lost your crop. And so banks sometimes don't like the, the index policies to loan. The other thing, I mentioned corruption earlier. We had people in Colorado that oh, on the rain gauges, we have one that used rain gauges, they put pie plates over the rain gauge so that the rain would not go into the gauge. And so it looked like they were having a major drought and they weren't. And so then we ended up with lawsuits of people saying, look, there was rain all around. Somebody, somebody tinkered with the, the weather gauge to try to collect on the crop insurance. So we've had some issues with our, with our programs, but it is more cost effective. The premiums are lower. Um, but it's not as an individual coverage as much it is, is the area. And so you could have a loss um, where the grid does not. And so that can be a problem. Pros All and cons. Right. All right. I think Joan has to leave. And we thank you very much for setting time to be with us. I know you are riding right now. You are in the middle of Rocky Mountains. Uh, but you yeah. are doing <laughs> to set a time to stop by and talk to us. We thank you very much for your time and we, we are now allowing you to go. Thank you very much and be welcome again next thank time. You. Thank you so much for inviting me and I still hope to come to Tanzania someday and see the crop insurance and see the farms. That is my hope. Definitely, thank you. we are looking forward for that soon. All right. Uh, while Joan is leaving, I think the same question. Isa, can you have you have something to add on this? I think uh, uh, to add on what uh, Duan has said, eh? you know, uh, Albert said we have challenges because uh, the insurance that we are offering we are offering is more uh, dependent on weather. So I think one solution would be uh, advancement in technology in terms like Duan said you, someone might temper with the weather gauge just to to claim so there has to be mechanism that uh, uh, these things for as far as it's weather index uh, uh, insurance then it has to be monitored in terms of uh, frauds and just to avoid the adverse loss that the insurance company might might suffer so uh, that is what I can add from what Duan has said. Sure. Thank you very much. Yusuf, do you have anything? Oh, I should welcome some more questions from the members. So members, please, if you want to talk, you can raise your hand on your chat there. You can raise your hand so that I can give you time. <clears throat> we still have 15 minutes. So uh, some Satish has also uh, asked here, is crop yields can be better indexed than other yields? I mean, than other index, sorry. Yusuf. Oh, Isa. Yusuf can go ahead. Yusuf, get the you question well? I didn't get the question well. Okay, can crop yields be better index like you we have weather the other index can for the case of africa can uh, the crop yields be a better index that's the question from satish honestly in modeling crop yield is the outcome so i, I don't know you, you, you are an actual scientist you can help me this <laughs> uh, 
All okay. right, so I'll turn okay. it to Issa because you are <laughs> actually an expert, so probably in terms of risk and the Okay, uh, to, to my understanding, uh, when we, we say the, the crop yields is like uh, we are taking the, the area or the hectares that the farmer has and compare uh, whether in the ratio that's okay, for one acre this farmer will, has produced uh, how many kilogram of, of maize. So if that uh, threshold that we, we have agreed uh, from the inception of the police goes down to what uh, uh, has been realized at the end or during the harvest, then that, uh, that farmer will then be covered. So I think this, it's more, uh, it's not general. It depends on the type of crops. It depends on uh, the insurance, or I mean the underwriting capacity and the modeling of the uh, insurance company that has. But in both ways, uh, whether it's more uh, dependent on the uh, weather experience and then the crop yields depend on what the farmer is going to harvest at the end of the period, which again, it's an, a function of the rainfall which is again a weather, a weather issue. So both of the approach will be sufficient for, for as long as it is uh, for specific uh, crops or farmers or the underwriting capacity and other uh, operating uh, environment that a certain jurisdiction has. Oh, all right, I think in house here we have uh, some other actuaries. I can see Mona here. So hopefully uh, the question can well be answered probably through the chats, etc. So uh, another question here, which I have received is that uh, uh, with the current change in the climatic condition, do we think uh, uh, index the product can work in Africa? Let's bear in mind that in Africa, we mostly practice traditional farming depending on the season to produce. That's just a follow up question. Uh, feel free, Isa, Yusuf, or anyone from the list who wants to contribute on this, you are allowed because of the discussion time right now. But they'll, okay. Okay, Isa, can you go ahead? I can't hear you. Uh, okay, uh, Yusuf, can you go ahead while we are waiting for Issa to fix the issue? Yusuf? Oh. Yusuf, you are muted. Hello. Good, good, good. Yeah. Yes, what were you saying? Uh, I've just said uh, about this question. Uh, with the current change in the climatic condition, do we think whether indexed products can work in Africa? Let's bear in mind that uh, Africa, we depend on uh, mostly traditional uh, farming where we depend on season to produce. So can it be a good solution to insurance uh, in Africa? You know, climate conditional changes in Africa, they are reality, but they are totally unpredictable. You get it. And the nature of farming in Africa is also, you know, purely subsistence with very few people who are trying to put in large farms. But uh, given the nature of, I think they can work. Uh, we can index insurance still has a lot to play in this case. You get it. And though it's not, um, we cannot peg it to everywhere. It has to be, you know, for specific regions and something like that. Right. Isa, is your problem, please? I think you are still facing the, the same problem. Uh, okay. So, uh, Isa, I can hear you. Hello? I get you, Isa. All 
right. Uh, I think we are. Okay, Isa, go ahead. Still facing this. I can hear you, Isa. Oh. Anyway, uh, I think it's an issue. Okay, uh, while we are waiting, Isa, to face, we have received uh, some explanation from Thomas here. From the explanation, I think the price index uh, is the best. Uh, Sorry, uh, I repeat. From the explanation, I think price index is the best simply because it measures the price of the produced products, which is the main determinant of the profit rather than crop yield. As under modern technology, we can be assured of the output from uh, from our production, but marketing and pricing is a bigger problem uh, in Africa. So that's a, a, like a explanation to the additional to the index, uh, the question asked by the previous member. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, because of time, uh, let me, uh, let me, Yusuf, can you hear me? Okay, you're muted, Yusuf. I was saying something related to what Thomas was trying to answer. Yes. Given the nature of the value chain and movement of products from you know the farmers and the, the market and so on, if you are going to use price index, it becomes really complex. I think the best metric to use here we should go back to top yield index rather than bringing in the component of price because markets behave in a very volatile way you, we cannot based on them you know as metrics for measuring this all right thank you is uh you back i know can you hear me definitely very well go on okay i'll start with the first question whether uh i don't if i remember correctly you said uh, whether index will be a, an ideal solution compared to the fact that uh, we have the drastic climatic change and our agricultural sector is more dependent on the on the rainfall and stuff i think it's a high time uh, for uh, government and other developing partners to start implementing a new way like the new normal we should be focusing on uh, how the agricultural sector should be in the coming 10 or 15 years which means the irrigation schemes and so many other issues need to be uh, implemented. And the other uh, comment that I would like to make is on the, whether the yield, the yields, whether index or the price index as commented by Thomas. As Yusuf said, you know, currently we should ask ourselves who, uh, who monitor or regulate uh, the crops prices. Because at the end of the day, if we uh, tag our insurance into price, which is again, the economy is quite uh, very volatile. Everyone can have the, its own price. Around Kibaigua, Sumbawanga will have the different price for the same, same crop. Again, will uh, somehow uh, uh, like uh, attract some disputes between the insurance company and these farmers. And for as long as this is a very sensitive, this is a very sensitive people, it might again have conflict to the uh, government and uh, other authority. That uh, that are my uh, my comment. You are muted, Shilingi. All right, thank you. Uh, before we turn uh, the in, on in connection to that, there is a, a member from the floor here. Pricing and marketing are determined by the availability, that is supply, which touches directly the supply chains, which in turn is heavily. Are affected by the country's infrastructures. As Yusuf said, this could be much more complex in pricing when compared to weather indexed products. So uh, uh, 
this uh, I'll give you each Yusuf one minute to wind up and the Isa one minute to wind up before we call it uh, day. Yusuf, please, you're muted. All right. Okay. Uh, one thank minute, you. please. Thank you, Shiling, and the thanks, Isa, and the whoever was part of this. It was really an opportunity to contribute towards what really people need out there in regards to insurance and development of the sector. I was, uh, I'm really privileged and uh, I really loved sharing with you and looking forward to meeting you. Thank you so much. Uh, Isa? I think you can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes once again, uh, I am uh, thankful for participating in this webinar. Uh, as one among the people representing the insurance sectors. So uh, what I can uh, call upon to my colleagues, like the insurance companies and other insurance stakeholders is we have a room to provide solution to farmers and to save the agricultural sectors, which is uh, significantly uh, contributing to our economy. And again, calling upon the uh, government stakeholders to jointly uh, uh, develop strategies and initiative uh, to at least uh, have a strong uh, strategies to make sure that uh, we have a sustainable uh, agricultural growth over the year. So that is oh. what I can say. And again, thanks to member who found time to participate in this webinar. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the panelists. Uh, I could say I clap for on behalf of other members who are here. Uh, as well, uh, thank you all participants who have uh, given us 90 minutes. That's small. We have participants here according to some statistics here from all over the world. I have some participants from UK, US. <laughs> India, Tanzania, all of Africa. So I can't mention all the countries which uh, we had some participants here. But uh, what I want to is to thank you all. And the, now I turn back to the technical team and the, uh, Eduardo for final work. Eduardo?